it's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hey friends, this is Andy. This episode of Accelerate is brought to you by KiteDesk. KiteDesk is the all-in-one sales development platform that lets you manage all of your sales development activities, such as email, direct dial phone calls, and your daily to-dos, all in one place to open up conversations, book more qualified meetings, and really create a predictable pipeline. KiteDesk Flow and KiteDesk Find allows us to find exactly the right people in the industries we're looking for, in the roles that we're looking for. That's KiteDesk customer Michael Orfis. Michael is head of sales at Stratified. In addition to the all-in-one management of his sales development team's days, KiteDesk helps him with another big part of his job. We have the ability with KiteDesk to do what we call targeted campaigns. Our conversion rate from what we were doing in the past to what we're doing now has been really massive. So you don't have to take tons of time to research, prospect, then blast large lists of people but never turn into sales opportunities. We're seeing higher clicks, we're seeing higher open rates, and without question, we've seen a massive increase in pipeline generation. So to learn more about KiteDesk, schedule a free demo, and learn how to create predictable pipeline at your sales organization, go to kitedesk.com forward slash accelerate. That's K-I-T-E-D-E-S-K dot com slash accelerate. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to be joined on the show again today by my friend Dan Waldschmidt, He's a keynote speaker, business strategist, ultra runner, which we're going to talk a little bit about, which we did last time as well, business owner, and maybe we can talk some about that too. So, Dan, welcome again to Accelerate. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me back. So, take a minute, may I introduce yourself, tell people sort of the, the range of things that you do. Uh, so, um, as you mentioned, uh, speak to large groups of people about ways to dynamically grow and scale uh, their ideas into things that make them lots and lots and lots of money. And we have a kind of contrary view, and of course, some people like that, and that makes us uh, a really unique uh, asset to our to our clients. Other thing that we do is, you know, um, you and I t- were talking before we started, you know, s- grabbing some time uh, for this recording, is as a guy who owns several businesses, I'm actually, you know, elbow deep in problems and strategies, and ideas um, every day. And so often what I'm writing about, frankly, is a, kind of an IV drip, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of trying to solve my own, you know, BS. So, so anyways, if, you, if, you, if you're someone who has a sentiment analysis, you can probably get my uh, emotional bandwidth by either what I've written about recently or, or what's coming out soon. So, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm a guy who, who really uh, likes to push against limits, push back against uh, the idea of impossible. And so it's in my personal life, it's running. Um, in my professional life, it's, it's, you know, how do we make millions and billions of dollars? And then uh, speaking to clients, it's like, how do I help you see the world in a different way where uh, you exceed your own expectations and then maybe transform yourself financially or physically or spiritually, those sort of things. All right, so let's talk about your your ultra running. Is so, what are your ultra goals for 2017? Uh, my goals are to run another few thousand miles. That's the one goal I've generally uh, mocked up for myself. I've done about 2,750 miles this year so far, um, mainly because that was my goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll run at least one 100 mile race this coming year. Um, it's becoming a little more a little more difficult um, just due to schedule. I did a few this year, did a few 50s. Um, so my goal is to uh, is to is to keep pushing that hundred mile, uh, adding a few more to the list. And I signed up last year for a 500 kilometer race, which is about 320 miles. And I did not run it for health reasons, uh, but uh, my <laughs> that for some is, for many people listening, that'd probably be the obvious answer. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but I well, think there's more reasons, to it for you. <laughs> yeah, health reasons before running it, not right, after. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, but my my 
my challenge this year, I think my one big goal is to run something beyond 100. Uh, I think 102, 105 is probably my longest distance. Uh, I want to push something beyond that. So even if it's not a 300 mile race, I might run a 200 mile race to see to see how I can do that. All right. So people are listening to this and saying, okay, gosh, I'm a busy person. But as you said, you own multiple businesses that require your direct involvement. And we talked about yes. earlier, you've, you've yeah. purchased a new company, you're sca- busy scaling it. So how do you fit everything in? I mean, how do you fit in 3,000 miles of running in a year? Uh, priorities. Um, you know, look, if, if um, it, you know, it, for me, running is what gives me clarity um, to think about, uh, you know, next steps. It's the thing that allows me to avoid, um, you know, false moves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's what allows me to look past the daily fear and grind that stops me from, uh, you know, uh, from being successful. And frankly, it's the thing that, um, uh, allows me to perform at the highest level that I can achieve myself personally. I was telling my therapist yesterday and, and, um, and I think the, the gentleman finds me quite amusing now after <laughs> years of work together, but I've been sick for about a week. I had some really, really crazy stuff going on in my head and swollen artery and some stuff. So I had not been running for about a week and I was telling him I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm going crazy. Running is the thing that allows me to have focus. And, and then when I come back from a run, I know exactly what I need to do. Uh, and I think, um, for me, it's that thing that, that focuses me and I go to it, uh, that meditation between meditation, transcendental meditation and running, these are the things that kind of keep me anchored and grounded. I think I can be more productive because the things that keep me focused and, and accountable. And I'll tell you this too, uh, when you're running a hundred mile race in the last race I just did, I was running through the mountains of Alabama and, uh, I, my, my previous race, I had finished a hundred miles in about 17 hours and 18 minutes. I found myself stuck about 20 miles into a race going, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. Right. Uh, unlike a business where you can nicely quit and give up. They say the average salesperson quits 11 months before they actually quit. Don't know if that's real or not, but it seems about right based seems on the sorry. salespeople. Yeah, yeah. I'm 20 miles into a 100-mile race. What can you do? You have to figure out how to make it work, right, because you're 20 miles in. So you either got to go 20 miles back to the starting line through the mountains and feel like a fool, or you've got to make a, find a way to make it to the, cross the finish line. And I did. It took me a full working day longer. So it took me 23 hours and 36 minutes. So the difference between 17 hours and almost 24 hours is just a vast amount. For almost a full working day, you have to think about why am I such a loser? Why can't I get this right? You know, what's (laughs) wrong with me that I'm I'm an elite, I'm a world record holding ultra runner. I can't seem to put it all together. And I think that's that moment of weakness of humility, of vulnerability, of, of raw trying, of, of forcing your perspective to change or you, or you die, you know, really, you, you know, you adapt or die. That sort of focus is exactly what I need to, to remain an elite uh, level of at speaking, at, at running, at, at doing business. And so for me, that's, that's the interconnection between all these different pieces. Yeah. Wow. Great story. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I won't even tell you my story. I, mean, I had a similar issue with my last half marathon I did, but I got a mile into it, and I was running, I was running with my sister, and and you know I said, "Geez, it it seems like we're running at a pretty fast pace, especially for her because she was hadn't didn't, done many of these." And I looked at my watch and said, "Oh, we're not running fast at all. What's wrong with me?" And yeah, it was yeah. it was a death march for the remaining twelve and a half miles, but you find a way. Yeah, yeah, you find a way. Yeah, and and I think that's the that's the beauty of it is if I could find a way to run a hundred miles, which you know for a while I thought was inconceivable, and then I did it, and I was like, oh, well, shoot, that wasn't that bad. Uh, which is you know, by the way, you don't say that when you cross the finish line. You say that a few days after you cross yeah, the finish line. Probably like giving birth. Yeah, exactly. I, I well, I have no experience in that except other. I know my legs were shaking and and all the parts of my body were saying you're fabulously hungry and, and all the, the things that came back, uh, almost like I, I kind of view them as like flashbacks weeks later, uh, where you're, you're thinking like, you know, why did I want to do this? How could I do this? And then there's like this quiet strength that says, dude, you don't even know that was possible and you did it. What else don't you know is possible that is next on your list of things to do? And so, you know, I, I just, you know, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a hundred miles. Maybe it's a couch to 5k, 
You know, sure. it's a 5K. As you said, maybe it's a half marathon. My wife's done a, a dozen or so half marathons, and she, that's her distance. She loves it. You know, that that's that's trying. That's her push. You know, pushing her own limits. Uh, physical exercise, I feel, and, and and it's not just my feeling. It's backed up by a lot of you know uh, coaches and and. Uh, and smarter people than me, that physical exercise does something interesting with your brain where it focuses you, it flushes out the fear you're feeling and allows you to have clarity and inspiration for everything else in your life. Often I'll tell the people that ask me about running, look, I don't eat calories to, to run and I don't run to burn calories. In fact, uh, if I go running and then I eat something, I'm not like the running doesn't cancel out the calories, but the running does something inside my body metaphysically, right? Uh, and, and quite physically, not just metaphysically, but, but quite physically where the, you know, my body is saying, Hey, we got to get ready. We have to be, be you know, we have, how we store fat matters, how we, how we optimize oxygen intake, all, all the things happen. And so that's very similar to a business. People often want to focus on like, I just want to improve how my salespeople close deals. And I forget, wait a minute. Why are you even focused on closing deals? Why not focused on you know, creating a, a brand or a perception or a customer experience that's so outrageously positive that the deals automatically close themselves? And so I think, the, 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 in my mind, and again, I know I'm somewhat of a nut job, but all these, these dots connect between business and sports uh, uh, to show that things that aren't necessarily a clear, uh, clear line, it's a dotted line. Uh, connect and they impact our lives. Just like it, for me, earlier this year when I was running from for, uh, Key Largo to Key West, about 40 miles in, I DNF. I had to drop out of this race. My kidneys were shutting down. I was in first place. I was doing quite well. And all of a sudden, in 102 degree weather with 98% humidity, the amount of salt that was in my body uh, was was out of whack with the amount of water I was drinking. And quite quickly, my kidneys shut down. And I started, you know, peeing this stuff that looked like maple syrup. It was not good. Uh, and, you know, um, it, and so a quick lesson is that it, does salt matter? Uh, no, it doesn't matter until you're trying to perform at a high level. And then it does matter. And all the tiny little variables that you shrug off as, oh, that doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter what my receptionist said. It doesn't matter what color my logo is. It doesn't matter how I answer the phone or what the presentation I have is to my clients. None of that matters. Just close more deals. You're probably wondering why your kidneys are shutting down or your revenue stream is shutting down. It's quite clear you're not optimizing uh, your, your, your company or yourself to perform at, at an elite level. And so, uh, the, the, you know, the things that shouldn't be killing you are taking you out of the game. Well, I think for a lot of individuals that came back to a point you'd made earlier is, is about prioritizing is, is I remember talking to somebody recently, uh, one of the guests talking about when they interviewed prospective salespeople, they talk about, uh, they try to measure the person's tolerance for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so when you're sort of working with people in business and so on and in your personal life is, you know, what are the things you have to sacrifice in order to become this elite business athlete or elite athlete in an athletic pursuit? I mean, it's, it's, there are tangible things. It seems like people want to overlook that. So as I think as people sort of plan going forward is, is one of the things they have to be conscious of is what are they prepared to sacrifice? You're absolutely right on that. What, I often tell you know leaders it's not even what you're willing to do because people will say to me oh Dan you you know and I'm sure they say it to you right you know you know you have no idea Andy I'm gonna do this I'm gonna make this happen like you you're never gonna see someone as as as, as motivated and, and driven as me uh, and you're like okay great let's go do it and they check in with him later and you're like uh, what are you doing and they give you this list of what they're doing and it's like okay great you're doing some things that's a great start. But it's not so much what you're willing to do that makes you successful, as you just mentioned about sacrifice. It's what you're willing to do without until you start reaping the rewards of that of that of that uh, success. And so there's people that you try to coach and improve. It doesn't add up. Why aren't they successful? Why isn't it working? Why aren't they growing as quickly as you think they should be growing? And then you realize, wait a minute, that guy has too many shows in his Netflix queue. Mm -hmm. I, you know, has to do these things and he's not willing to sacrifice the indulgement of another Netflix show. And by the way, that's an hour, that's two hours. And you're like, where did your time go by there? It went right there. You made that choice. 
I went to seminary and I live in the South. And so all that combines to say, you know, within 10 miles of my house in South Carolina, there's like 300 Baptist churches. And so in, in the South, uh, we blame God for everything, right? In the North where I'm <laughs> from, Washington, D.C., we blame the government, right? We blame in politics, we blame stupid voters. But in the South, we blame, we blame Jesus. And so you'll talk to someone, they'll be like, hey, bless your heart, Andy. You know, well, if God wanted me to be rich, he would have made me that way. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No, you made yourself that way by stupid choices and stupid decisions and lack of effort and, and, and you know, and, 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 and lack of, of focus. What I've noticed interesting about focus is that you need a little bit of desperation in order to get to where you want to be. If you're not desperate enough you know, then you're probably not going to do the things that are required to elevate your game to the level where you can compete and win to get across the finish line. You're just not going to do it. If you don't need it bad enough, you're going to walk away. And so uh, on my right arm, I've got the, a sleeve, you know, tattoos and, and the, the sleeve is of the Hernando Cortez burning ships. When Hernando Cortez right. came to South America, he famously said, burn the ships. And I don't know that they actually burned them. I think they just put holes in them and sank them. Why? He realized that all of his men, his men who had romanticized this idea of Latin America, beautiful Latina women, gold nuggets on the ground, exploration, and, and this kind of high sex appeal adventure, you know, machismo, alpha male sort of task, which is obviously all those things are associated with sales and revenue creation and, and high performance in business. And, and so he realized when things got tough, they could go home and go, well, listen, we got halfway across the island. We defeated a third of the Aztecs, right? I got two, two, you know, uh, two, you know, two steps uh, towards my goal uh, because they had ships and a, and a place to go back home to. And so Fernando said, if we're going to win, we're going to have to make it impossible to go back home empty handed. And so he said, burn the ships, burn it down. The only way to get back home to Europe is we're going to have to go through the Aztecs, conquer when, by the way, you know, that's pretty Machiavellian to say we're going to destroy other people that we have no right to destroy. We're just going to do that. We're going to take this. But we're going to take this ground. And when we get to the other side of the country, we're going to build new ships and then float those home. It's the only way back. And so I often tell people, uh, if you want to perform at a high level, and if that's really the conversation, no BS, no pretension. You're not saying that because you're trying to impress the person next to you. If you really, really, really want to change, I would tell you, build a list of five to 10 things in your life right now that you need to burn. It might be a relationship that's negative and needy to another person, probably. It might be, uh, you know, it might be that you're, uh, you know, you, you drive a vehicle that's way too expensive to, to appear that you're successful to other people. It, uh, there's a whole laundry list of things. If you're really serious and you put together a list of things, you'll be shocked at the number of things you're doing right now that you're doing just for appearance's sake and that are stopping you from, from conquering, getting to the other side of the, of the continent, in your world, whatever that means, and, and, and sailing your boat home with massive success. And yeah, so I, that's, I, I think part of the way I would sort of tell people about this is, is and teach it is, you know, what are the things that you have to unlearn? They always talk about what we want to learn in the coming year. What about things we need to unlearn? Yeah. I mean, you talked yeah, about exactly. fears, fears earlier, right? How do you unlearn your fears? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're, you're, after, you're definitely right. I mean, and, and by the way, you know, um, you know, these fears, these memories, uh, you know, come from memories. You know, you're fearless until you have a memory of something that causes you not to be afraid. First time you see a, you know, saber toothed tiger, you go, wow, that thing's angry, but I don't know. He hasn't killed anybody I know. And then you see a friend get hurt and you get hurt. Next time you're a little more cautious. And, and then pretty soon you don't even have to see a saber toothed tiger. All you have to see is the grass move in the distance a different way. And you're like, oh no. And it happens at business. It happens in a boardroom. It happens with a prospect's call. It happens with a spouse or, a, or, or, or another relationship where you see something start to change. It doesn't even change. You think it's going to change. And that fear drives you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And, and again, again, if you're going to perform at a high level, if you really want to change, if you really want to be amazing, then you have to talk yourself down. You have to say, Dan, that's not a saber toothed tiger. You know, that's just the grass. That's just the wind blowing. That boss isn't trying to find a way to fire me. He's just asking me for the status of that deal. He just wants to know what that deal is. He's not trying to find a way to throw me under the bus, but because of the way we're wired, 
we often uh, aren't aware of our initial gut responses. We just say, oh, I feel like I should be responding this way, that way I should. What we don't know is that, for instance, as, as a human being, uh, you know, the second your body feels fear, your your adrenaline glands click uh, click in, kick in, and and you start getting twitchy, and your mouth gets dry because your body shuts down your saliva glands to focus on more energy, and your stomach stops digesting food so you can focus that energy on surviving. Your body does all these things, and then you get dumped out of a stressful situation. It could be a boardroom or a sales call or a pipeline review or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm hungry, and why do I need water because my mouth is dry? All of these things, and you're not even aware that you're feeding into these fear, the negative outcomes of fear, and with a little bit of more self-awareness, with a little bit of self-improvement. You cannot just survive these moments. You can thrive in spite of what's going on around you. Yeah, well, along the same line, you, you've recently published an article about 25 things successful people refuse to do and sort of along the lines of you know, unlearning behaviors. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes sort of going through some of those because I thought there are a lot of good ones there. We don't have time to touch all 25. But uh, yeah, first on the list, which is, I, I think maybe you prioritized it this way, but is you say successful people refuse to make excuses for their own mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we spend a lot of time trying to excuse away why something didn't happen or, or you know, what, uh, you know, why your interpretation of that is, is wrong. And, yeah, and, just, and the reality is you just have to not make excuses, say I didn't perform, it didn't get there, we're going to try to do it better next time. Simple as that. Well, humility is a very powerful thing. Very powerful. I think one of the reasons why I enjoy running is that if there's one thing, I often use the word pure, and I know for those you know uh, people who are not that you know maybe hardcore about sports, you're like ah, shut up, Dan, calm down. <laughs> but you know when you're running, it is what it is, right? You the clock is the clock, and like you said, you look at your wrist and you're like, wow, I'm crushing it. And you're like, oh wait a minute, I'm not crushing it. You felt like you were crushing it, but when you checked the 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 the, the standard, uh, the fact was you weren't crushing it. Same with me. I'm 20 miles in, going. I don't know how I'm going to finish. Right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, and the reality is, you know, there are facts, there are there are there are realities about what works and what doesn't work, and you 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 know you can spend your time making excuses, or you can say I have a relentless desire to improve. So it doesn't matter where I'm at. What matters is if I make the decision to keep improving. Right. Well, another one that's very interesting to say: successful people refuse to copy what other people have done to be successful. And this is so interesting because in sales in particular, and you're familiar with this, is they always want to put the you know the strong salespeople on a pedestal and tell everybody else will do just what they've done. Mm-hmm. And the fact is that you're not going to succeed that way. You know, there's you're a unique individual, you have unique strengths and capabilities. And so much about sales these days is you know putting people into pro- rigid processes and not letting the individual really thrive the way they could. I have nothing to add to that besides exactly, exactly. Well, well said, well done. You're exactly right. Uh, it's easy for us, you know, the, the whole get rich quick scheme is, is, you know, Hey, I sell coffee. And if you, if you sell my coffee beans to 17 of your friends and they all sell to 17 of their friends, you're going to retire to the beach and do no work and life is good. And, you know, I know I'm oversimplifying things and, and perhaps taking a dramatic example there, painting a dramatic example, but as you know, uh, life is much, much more difficult than that. I, uh, if you're ever on YouTube and can stomach a few F bombs, look up CT Fletcher, a uh, guy who's, uh, grew up in Compton and 22 inch arms. He talks about working out. He said, there is no seven minute workout. You know how you get big arms. You put in the time. You put in the time. There are no shortcuts. There are no there are no easy paths, you know, to getting in shape. You have to put in the time. The same way with sales. And so that's why I write a lot about philosophy, not exact steps. And you're a guy who's actually, you know, you're you're you you've written a, you know a couple things and and uh, you talk about optimizing. You talk about how improving. And uh, you know, people will say, you know, a lot of a lot of what you've tried to refine and hone is you know, how to do more of what you're good at, you know, better. Um, right. But I could, I could, I don't have the same strengths as you. I tell people all the time, I dropped out of college twice. <laughs> I'm basically a village idiot. You know, I'm surprised people pay me any amount of money to help them drive their business towards rapid acceleration, right? But there are people around me who can look at a situation with this deep analytics and go, 
here's exactly what you need to do, you know, to have a 10 minute recipe for X, Y, Z. Here's a perfect way to do it. I could never do that. So if I try to copy you or you try to copy me, you're in for a rude awakening. There has to be this self-awareness to say, what am I truly gifted with? What, what, what sort of pain and chaos am I willing to stomach? You know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How do I use those to get to where I need to be? Well, another one that's, that I think is really interesting that you talk about, and this is you know, part and parcel of what we've been talking about so far, is, is you say successful people refuse to look down on others around them who aren't winners yet. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and we yeah. see this so often because, you know, again, part of what we see in sales is, is too often managers sort of encourage this, this class system <laughs> within sales and take actions that sort of reinforce it rather than giving everybody a, an opportunity to succeed. That's right. And the reality is it takes people different amounts of time to be successful. I'm in a business right now where we've got competitors who several years ago, they looked like they were ahead of us. Here's why. They spent vast amounts of money, millions and millions and millions of dollars on building out their own data warehousing infrastructures, basically building data centers. You hear about uh, Apple building these billion dollar Mm -hmm. data centers. So we have competitors who built out many versions of those, um, and not M-A-N-Y, M-I-N-I, many tiny, ver- tiny versions of an Apple data center, and they spent millions. And they thought, we're going to drive the cost down. And then all of a sudden, Amazon comes along, and now they have storage at two pennies per gigabyte. Two pennies. Now, the reality is you, you, you've spent millions and millions of dollars building an infrastructure that is now obsolete. Time, time. Uh, and sur- has 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 a uh, an interesting way of changing perspective, and so uh, there are a lot of people who seem like they're slow and plodding who come out far ahead. One quick example, um, you know, Jeff Bezos mm-hmm. spent was a manager at McDonald's before he founded Amazon, paid his way. Uh, his early way through school, working as a manager in McDonald's. I, it probably doesn't seem like you're a super success story when you're a manager at McDonald's. Let's go one step further. I think it was 94 or 97 when he started Amazon.com as this business, which would allow you to get a used book from one side of the country to another side of the country off a computer screen, and the website was pretty bare bones. Um, he didn't make a profit for almost 24 years and now runs one of the most successful companies in the globe. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? Is that he, he had this view of what success was like. And if you judged him in between now and then, you would have had different judgments. You know, Microsoft was crushing it. And now Apple's crushing it. Guess what? Last month, the, uh, uh, the Microsoft Surface, this brand new computer that Microsoft has come to, outsold the MacBook. It looks like the tables are turning back again. And so we have this chance to go. I'm not going back to Windows. (laughs) There you go. I'm not either. I'm not either. But the reality is, is that uh, you you have to have a mission. You have to know why you want what you want and what you're willing to do to go get it. And, 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 you know, along the way, there'll be those who judge. It's just a waste of your time and, 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 and uh, to, to, to look at other people and go, you're not what I think you should be. Therefore I'm judging you. And right. It's just a waste of your time, and it, it also limits you from going. What's that person doing that I could learn from and improve? Yeah, well, and so a couple another point in there is you know you talk about successful people refuse to waste their time doing things that don't matter, and you know time and time and time again, we're always reminded that you know there's the one thing we're trying to accomplish, you know that mm-hmm. one thing, and to. Yeah, rigid, you know, in a very disciplined fashion. And you talked about early in the show, but you, know, you prioritize. Is that This is a hard thing for people to master. Yeah, you have to know what you want and you have to know what, why you want it. It's got to be a deeply held emotion, you know, and a lot of people have written and discussed that. And then you got to change your priorities. If, you're, if it's hard for you to change and adapt, then you struggle when circumstances force you to have to adapt in, in a day or in an hour or in a week, right? It's hard for you. But you have to kind of in your mind say, what's the most important thing? And then what should I be doing right now? I often challenge our teams with this question. Does it really matter? Does it matter? Look, I, I, we, earlier in the conversation, we are talking about the importance of details. But also an equally important question is, does it really matter? 
right? Doesn't mm-hmm. really matter, you know? And so asking yourself this question helps you adjust your priorities uh, real time, you know, and allows you to perform at a high level despite what's going on around you. You know, right. uh, this election was a big, uh, uh, you know, show. <laughs> and there's a word you could put in front of that, right? It's a big, a big <laughs> mess. Uh, the reality is it, what's changed in our lives since then. I mean, Lockheed Martin's getting railed on for building, you know, an F-35 or the new Air Force One. But I mean, seriously, like what, how has our lives improved or or, or gotten worse in the last bit of time, and how will they? The reality is it's probably not gonna change a lot for most of us, it's just not. And so we spend time agonizing over, I have to follow this debate, and I have to be a part of this thing, and I have to do that, and this other thing, and then you look back and go, wow, I spent a lot of effort, I spent a lot of money, a lot of time on things that you could argue, looking back, don't really matter. Yeah, well, I mean, this is actually on your list of 25. That's number 22, as successful people refuse to let the current chaos distract them from future success. They can't. And that comes from knowing your priorities. What's more important? And uh, by the way, I'm, I'm a DC guy. We're 19th and K. We're right downtown, downtown, downtown DC. I mean, literally. Uh, literally, K Street. Mm-hmm. That's us. And I'll tell you, it's easy to get fall into that bubble of, oh, so-and-so got elected for secretary of labor. Wow. Okay. Well, what's that mean for this? And how's it, and who's going to do it? And, and everyone starts hyperventilating. goes, take us, take a step back. Does it matter? You know, what does matter is I helped my son, my 12 year old son study for his finals. Uh, and he got a B plus on a test that I thought he was going to get a D on. Now that matters. Secretary of Labor doesn't really matter, right? But that 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 B plus does matter. But it's easy to lose perspective when you're not focused uh, uh, on 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 priorities. You just let the chaos of the moment sway you left and right and right and left, and you forget that what you're watching is a isn't a new show. It's entertainment. It's there to keep you, you know, coming back after the break because there's this juicy story, right? This scintillating thing, uh, you know, uh, and instead of saying, hey, listen, you're watching a, a, a dramatic production of what could be called sometimes news. Yeah. Well, I think that the, you know, the lesson is for a lot of people is, is just to keep in mind. And I certainly saw it, you know, I looked at, at uh, during the election period, like the month of November, just in listenership to this podcast is is we saw a little bit of a dip because people were distracted. So, yeah, politicians come and go. And administrations will come and go. But, yeah, you've got one opportunity to lead and live your own life. One of the things I think about sometimes, and again, I'm not trying to be overly um, morbid, but I'll, I'll watch, you know, as I travel a lot, and I know you do as well, um, and you're in an airport, you're looking around and you see, uh, older executives or older people, you know, older husbands and wives. And, and I sometimes ask myself, well, what I'm doing now matter when I'm that age, but will it? And that's a hard question to answer, but it's something I keep coming back to. Um, will it matter? Am I doing things that matter or am I just falling prey to the next, you know, get rich quick scheme or am I falling prey to things that I'll look back and go, you know, I'm unhappy and I'm disgruntled and I've ruined my life on things that that just have not done anything for anybody else. They're selfish. Mm. And so, you know, some things I think about uh, as I look around. No, it's, it's, it's a great point. I mean, it's it's you have to have that that passion that drives you. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, the passion could be, look, I just want to provide for my family and you know, exactly. give them opportunities that I didn't have or it could be. Yeah, I'm trying to make a huge difference in the world, but you really need to identify what that is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Okay. Last segment of the show, I've got just a handful of standard questions I ask all my guests. And since you've been on the show before, you get a different set of questions. Um, so first one is, is, in your mind, is it easier to teach a technical non-salesperson how to sell or teach a salesperson how to sell a technical product? I think it's easier to only hire salespeople who are hungry and teachable. And that's what we do. If you're not hungry or teachable, you don't get hired. The rest fills in the, the rest fills itself in automatically. Okay. All right. So next question is what is one book that's not a business book, not a sales book, like a literary book that you recommend that every salesperson should read? 
You know, I'm reading some philosophy books by Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. One of the things, um, you know, one of the things that I've been doing, uh, following a lot is this idea of stoicism. Right. Uh, And uh, uh, a book that if you want to, if you want an easy book, there's one called uh, um, The Daily Stoic 365 uh, you know, basically not devotionals, but daily reads that are two paragraphs each that will help you, um, understand it. Another book that I think you would like is called meditations. Go grab this on your Kindle meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And it's really neat. I mean, it takes you a minute because of the, how things are worded to like understand it. But I went to seminary and I was studying Greek. So, you know what I mean? So it's not, you know, you can do Greek, you can do, you know, you can do you know, English, but it's really, it's really awesome. Um, you know, you read some of these books, you read how the greatest general, uh, of the Roman empire, um, how he really, how he sold the world. It is so incredible. It'll inspire you to kind of create your own kingdom. Well, I think it's interesting when you read some of those Stoic philosophers or, you know, Roman philosophers, even Greek, is that, you know, their perception of the human condition wasn't too terribly different than the way we look at it. That's right. No, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. But they had, you know what I find interesting is they had this, and the Greeks did it. They, they, they spent a lot of time on philosophy, on not just surface level stuff. They dug into this idea of, you know, your years are a vapor. And, and, and this idea, not that we're looking at a mortality, but like understanding that you have a limited number of days. It, it was really, really neat how they, they, they didn't push the idea, the scariness of life, but they talked about purpose. And what I like, I connect to that because I'm thinking, you know, it's usually – it's not this surface level discussion of how do I make money and I want to go on vacation. And I want, it's really this, what am I doing that matters? Once you figure that out, everything else just kind of falls into line. It's like that picking a lock, you know, it's like once you get a couple of the pins headed in the right direction, everything else takes care of itself. But if you don't know the basics of how to get inside your own head, then, you know, you'll, you'll, um, You'll always struggle. By the way, I'm I'm a nerd for biographies too. So I've, <laughs> I was reading um, I was reading a book about pre story of Steve Prefontaine, right? And um, and I love that. And the, uh, you know, there's a couple other sports books. One's called Duel in the Sun um, that that I love too, which is about uh, uh, Alberto Salazar, right. one of the greatest runners of um, of well, I guess of America. Yep. Uh, you know, and 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 in his um, he won a race that was um, pretty hotly contested. Anyways, I love those stories because you see the agony and the effort. And I think that compares to where we're at right now, which is uh, this idea that in between here and there, there being the finish line, there's a lot of struggle. And we often summarize people's success stories by, oh, Bezos, yeah, he's the founder of you know, Amazon. And oh, yeah, Tim Cook, yeah, oh, yeah, he's the CEO of Apple. Oh, yeah, what was he before he was the CEO of Apple? What was he before he was at Apple? He was an engineer in an aluminum plant in Alabama. Mm-hmm. And so we, we often cut out that crap in the middle, the struggle. You know, uh, we, we forget that Doug McMillan worked in the warehouse before he was CEO of Walmart. Right? We, we cut all this stuff out and then we go, oh, that guy, he must have had better parents. He must have had a better education. He must have something I don't have. Well, that may be true. He may have more drive. He may have more insight. He may have more self awareness and emotional intelligence and things like that. But he, none of he has nothing. Nothing that you can't also have. Exactly. So time after time after time, you see these examples. Uh, you know, Cheryl Sandberg worked, worked in a mall as a right. retail clerk. You know, you look at, anyways, example after example, uh, you read it from these biographies, which I love the richness of them because you're thinking you got 500 pages or 400 pages or, you know, God bless you, 300 pages, right, of, of something where you can read his biography of someone's story and you go, wow, this guy had a really, really rough agonizing time right and yet he he crossed the finish line the lesson for us should be i'm not any different than them i'm going through the same thing that steve jobs went through right i'm going through the same thing you know that that was another success person was life isn't unfair to me um you know i don't need any special breaks right. i need to apply the effort to get to where i need to be okay so one last question for you is is do you have a favorite quotation or words of wisdom you live by my nephew asked me, what's one thing you would, you would ask? And I said, belief. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my twenties and early thirties, um, not believing myself, 
I listened to everyone else, maybe because I dropped out of school and I had a mom who said, you'll never be somebody unless you get a degree, despite building a couple companies that were millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and so I think if you can believe, believe that you're worth it, believe that your idea is worth it, um, believe that your dream is worth it, just believe. Belief has an interesting way of impacting everything you do. When you believe that a pill is going to heal you, you get better, even if it's just a placebo, right? right? We know this. We know this. The power of belief, real belief, not shaking your head, but really believing. When you think of what people do when they believe, they, they blow themselves up, right? They, they do all of this fanciful stuff that we, our minds can barely understand when you believe. And so if there were one, there, there's, you know, one uh, one code or mantra I live by, it's belief. May, let me give you one short, one longer phrase that I, that I, that I remind myself every day sure. when I meditate. It's this, if you want something you have never had, you must do something you've never done before. Um, this is one of those affirmations that I repeat to myself every day. If you want something you've never had, you must do something you've never done before, which means simply this. If you're listening to this podcast and you've bought, you know, Andy's books and you've listened, read the blog and you, you've consumed and you're like, you know, hey, I want to be successful. How do I do it? Here's how you do it. You do something you've never done before. Uh, and that might be trying harder. It might be trying something different. It might be asking for help. It might be paying for help. Uh, whatever. But don't ever imagine that you're going to get something you've never had before doing the same thing you've always done before. You've got to change and you've got to want to change. And when that happens and you believe that it's going to pay off and be worth it in the end, your whole life is magical. It is not. It's easy. It's magical. Right. Perfect. Well, a great way to end. Well, Dan, thank you for joining me again. That was fantastic. So tell folks how they can find out more about you. Uh, just Google me, danwalchman.com. Um, and there's blogs and there's nothing to sell you, but you know, if you go online, you can download some, some, some calendars and some insights and some workbooks and things like that, that, that'll be helpful to you. Um, and again, we're in the transformation business. So go to danwalchman.com and you can read some stuff and argue with me about what works and doesn't work. But, um, goal is just to get you to think differently. Excellent. Once you see life differently, uh, right. your whole life can be different. Perfect. Great way. So thanks again for, for joining me. And remember, friends, thank you for spending this time with us. Make it a habit, as we remind you every day, make it a habit to deliberately learn something new every day to help you accelerate your success. An easy way to do that, join my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Dan Walschmidt, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. And if you enjoy Accelerate and the value we're delivering, then please take a quick minute right now to leave your feedback about this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. It'd be very much appreciated. So thanks again for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.